Dr. Blackstock, Uche, um, you have been involved in advancing health equity. In fact, that's the name of the organization that you founded. How has our national and state distribution plan and execution uh, for the COVID vaccine been man manifested in your uh, patient populations in New York? Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, first, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for having me as a, as a guest on this panel this evening. I could not say no to Dr. Lightfoot, who um, attended medical school with my mother. So any of my mother's classmates asked me to be on a panel, I have to say yes. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm an emergency physician and I was, I was working um, last spring here in New York City uh, when it was the epicenter. And I actually saw with my own eyes, uh, my patient population shift uh, within, within weeks um, to mostly black and brown patients. They were mostly essential workers uh, and service workers. And I even said to, this, to the staff at the urgent care site I was working at, I said, do you notice that all our patients look like us now? And I have to say, just um, going back a little bit, that once I had seen um, that the patients in China who did poorly were patients with chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, obesity, I knew that um, Black communities and other communities of color were going to be heavily impacted. And so I actually just started writing. I actually wrote several op-eds. One was in Scientific American, another in Slate about how I was very concerned that um, due to systemic racism, right, that was exposed by the pandemic, um, that these communities would be most disproportionately impacted. And we, we've seen that so far in terms of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And I was hoping that we would learn from that, right? That we would learn from that, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but I, I feel like the vaccine rollout process, um, while I think equity, um, equity, equity has been considered, um, I think that it, it feels a lot like it's an afterthought. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I wanna say that, you know, a lot of the issues, the structural issues that we're dealing with are, you know, decades and centuries old. So to be able to um, address them within a short period of time, obviously is a very challenging task. Um, but I think that there were some things in the, in, in the rollout process that we could have done differently. Um, one, I think that, you know, allocating vaccines according to need uh, versus population um, it's sort of like taking the colorblind approach, essentially. Um, vaccines, I feel, should have been allocated um, by which areas were hardest hit. And so and that's a matter of using different metrics like the CDC's uh, Structural Vulnerability Index. There are other indices that have been developed. There's a COVID-19 community index that could have been used. Um, so, you know, that was one concern that I had, but also this idea of having these priority groups. And of course, I think group one, I think most people probably would not have had an issue with because those were healthcare workers who were the most exposed uh, and people in long-term care facilities who were the most vulnerable. But again, I, 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 you know, I think that those were also colorblind approaches because both those groups were actually disproportionately white as well. Because when you look at um, who most healthcare workers are, it, it is mostly white. And when you look at who has a lo the longest life expectancy in this country, um, it's not people of color. Um, and, and so um, I think the um, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices tried to use uh, chronic diseases as a surrogate and other you know, essential worker positions. But I think that when, you, when you, we think about how, sort of how, how so brutally systemic racism impacts health and then not to really consider it explicitly in the, in the rollout process, we see what we've seen so far and that's that we have under-vaccinated um, Black and Latino populations um, um, significantly, and we still have. Um, you know, my concern was when eligibility opened in April that we would um, maybe see some reinforcement of these inequities because some of the kinks in registration processes, accessibility weren't worked out. But it looks like in the last two weeks, um, over half the people who have received vaccines are people of color. But I think that what happens is once you throw uh, age, fixed age cutoffs out the window, open eligibility to as many people as possible, you increase accessibility. Those people who had difficulty 
getting vaccines are able to, to access the vaccines. Um, there still are about 30 million people out there who are considered vaccine amenable. These are people who are um, mostly working class. They don't have college education. Many of them uh, are concerned about missing work because they don't have paid, uh, paid time off to get their vaccines. They are basically just trying to survive. And so we need to think about ways that we can help these 30 million people to get these vaccines. I think employers can do a lot in terms of, you know, uh, the, the Biden administration has offered a tax credit to businesses for offering their employees paid, paid sick leave, um, but you can have on-site vaccine clinics um, and offer other incentives. Really at this point, um, if we hope to um, reach that herd immunity threshold, then we really need to think about sort of innovative ways that we can get vaccines to everybody. And I think that you know, really the message is bringing the vaccines uh, um, to the people. So again, there's still a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. I think if we are thinking about getting to that 70% of Americans with one dose by July 4th, um, that we need to think about more local and hyper-local efforts in terms of a vaccine distribution um, uh, and, and using you know, community-based organizations, so organizations that are already embedded in these communities um, to help you know, uh, uh, with, with access and outreach as well as education.